just wanted to open with a quick, with a quick song, and we're going to give Evan and Sam a few minutes to just do some of the tunes. Let's start with number 100. Great is thy faithfulness, number 100. Zero, zero. Hmm. We could do it in Acapulco, but it's better with the piano. <laughs> Acapella. Evelyn sounds better on the piano than I do a cappella. 100. Thank you for running down. Great is thy faithfulness. 100. Zero, zero, 100. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to Sabbath School. If you're here and you're watching online, you are our family. This could be your first time with us, and you know what? You're our family. We are the family of God. So let's pray together. Precious, loving Heavenly Father, I am grateful for your faithfulness. 
I am grateful, God, that you have brought us in to part of your family. That through your son, Jesus, and the gift that he gave at the cross, we are family. And as we worship together today, let it not be me speaking, Lord, but to be your Holy Spirit. May I be used, God, to glorify your name. And may I be used, God, to speak something that will change and touch the hearts of all who listen. May we glorify you, God. May we love you, and may we love each other in the way that you fully intended us to do. In your name of your son, Jesus, amen. Okay. I have a story to share to you, and it's a true story. And I thought what I would do is share a couple of things that I learned while I was reading the story. Do you like good stories? Yeah, especially when they're true. Okay, let me start with a quote from Ellen White. I'm gonna read the quote to you before I read the story, and then I'm gonna close with the same quote because I think it's the core of the story, of the lesson of it. It says, and this is in Messages to Young People, it says, the Lord will hear our prayers for the conversion of souls. God's people will let their light shine forth, and unbelievers seeing their good works will glorify their Heavenly Father. Wow. Wow. Do you want to be a light for God? Yeah. Could you turn on the news or listen to the news and see light? No. Probably not. Could you look around in your circle of friends and family and see light? Maybe. Maybe some have light, but there's an awful lot of darkness around us. And I firmly believe there is no way that people that are sitting in darkness will come to know who Jesus is if they don't see it in you. So I'm going to read you a story, and it's so full of light. You're going to love this story. As I start this story, let's go to Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. And I just want to read that verse before we start this story. For the word of God is living and powerful. Do you believe that? It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces even to the division of the soul, unspirit of joints and marrow, and it's the discerner of thoughts and tents of the heart. You might be able to lie to yourself, and you might be able to lie and trick others, but you are not going to be able to lie to God. That's the truth of this. All right. We're going to kill you. A hooded teenager sneered as he stepped towards the two girls and the eight others that surrounded. The place? It was a dangerous, dark neighborhood in Venezuela. The girls, Damaris and Inez, two 14-year-olds, were selling Adventist books and mag magazines to earn tuition. The situation? At noon that day, Inez had gone to a lady's house for a Bible study. She found a note on the door asking her to return at 6 p.m. Damaris had another appointment, so Inez went alone to the study. The study lasted longer than expected, but finally Damaris rejoined Inez as they started home. Before entering a particularly dangerous area, Inez and Damaris stopped to pray. They claimed this promise. I will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. Right there's the first lesson. Before we come to a dark and dangerous situation, what are we supposed to do? Bow our heads and pray. And if you're in doubt that you're in a dangerous and dark situation, it's never going to hurt to stop and pray and ask God, what should I do in this situation? How can I glorify you, God, in what I'm getting ready to do, in what I'm getting ready to say? There's power in the word of God. There's power in God, and it has the power to change hearts and convict sins, convict of sins. 
do it. Suddenly, a sense of danger, a cold chill ran down their backs. In the distance, we saw something move. Inez said, we saw several men coming towards us. Damaris clutched my hand in terror, and again, we stopped and we prayed. When they opened their eyes, they were surrounded by nine teenage boys. God is with us, Damara whispered, and they stood very quiet. The youngest youth turned to a gang member and said, do it. The one that had spoken held up a knife. Drop that bag or we'll kill you, he snarled. Inez put her bag on the ground and told the boy, God loves you. Startled, he just stood there. He was surprised and he was confused. Can you imagine? What would be the first thing you would say if someone was holding a knife or a gun up to you? I believe this is the second lesson that I got from this. What the decisions we make every single day prepare us for what we're facing. We don't know what we're coming up against. They couldn't have known they were going to come up against that. But they made decisions every day to pray, to read the Bible, and to be filled with God's Spirit. Those are decisions that we make every day. It's preparing us for what's going to come. And in that moment, when you don't have time to think about what's right or what's wrong, it will be your instinct to say the word of the Lord. It will be your instinct to, to speak truth. Get back in line, the leader shouted to the young boy. Damaris and I prayed silently that God would make would work a miracle to save us, Inez said. Then I began to talk to them of Jesus' love. I told them that Jesus had left his home in heaven and had come here to die for them. Why are you telling us, the leader demanded. We came to rob you, not for a sermon. Inez answered, Jesus came to save you, to change you from a sinner to one of his followers. And we must tell you about him. I'm totally blown away by this story. Can you imagine being a 14-year-old girl, terrified, no parents around, and another 14-year-old girl, and you've got the boldness to want their salvation above your own safety? Amen. Think about that for a minute. They were more worried about those boys and what their outcome would be than their own safety. I believe that can only come because God sits inside their hearts. The leader pulled a gun out of his belt, and he held it to her head. He said, if you keep talking, I am going to kill you, he growled. Even if you kill me, I must tell you, Jesus loves you, and he wants to change your life, Inez replied. You're crazy, the leader said. He lowered his gun and says, how does Jesus change people? What can he do for me? Jesus loves you, Inez said. The same as he loved those who crucified him, the boy seemed surprised that the girls did not fear for their lives. The leader asked him, how are you going to change? How, how am I going to change? What's going on, one youth demanded. Aren't we going to kill them? I can't kill these girls, the leader said. I have a feeling coming over me that I cannot resist. Inez told him, you are feeling God's love. He wants to change you. God is in this place, Inez said, and Jesus is calling you to follow him. She had been hugging her Bible the whole time but she held it out to the leader of the gang. Slowly he took it and said, thank you. Don't you remember? We've come to kill these girls, one boy said. Ines turned to him and says, Jesus wants you. Jesus wants you. 
He wants to give you a new life. You're crazy. He spat, he spat out as he slapped her across the face. Inez spoke quietly to him. Jesus loves you, and he will love you no matter what you do. Damaris then spoke. God has a purpose for your life. Well, I'd like to know what God's purpose is for me, he said. Well, maybe this will help you understand. And Damaris said this as she handed each and every one of those boys one of the Adventist magazines. She said, God bless you. We're going to go now. The boys parted, and they let them walk through the circle. Down the road, the girls turned and waved and said, Someday we'll see you again. The Lord will bring us together. I'm going to pause there. There's more to the story. Is God's word powerful? God's word is spoken by the power of the Holy Spirit. And just as powerful as God is, his spoken word can change hearts and change lives. And we should never underestimate that. John 1.1. 1, 1. We're going to read John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God spoke the world into existence. His Word is true, and it will accomplish for whatever it sets out to do. Think about that for a minute. God is not a man that he would tell a lie. So if he spoke a promise in this Word, it's as good as it's happened. Because God has the ability to speak things before they ever come to be, including seeing eight boys who were ready to kill two girls. He knew that they would come across those girls, and he has the power to do things before they even see. Second lesson is that they prayed, I talked about this, they prayed for protection and claimed promises written in the word. They were also speaking boldly for Jesus. In a moment of crisis, what will you do? It'll be what you've made a habit. I want to give you an example to this real quick. What you'll do in a crisis is what you've made a habit to do. When I was in nursing school, they would run us through these scenarios with a mannequin. And we would all be nervous and shaking and scared because you're getting graded on it. But in, this mannequin would quit breathing. This mannequin would stop their heart. And they want to know what you're going to do. What are you going to do when your patient, when your patient stops breathing and, and encodes on you? We did that over and over and over. Hook up the oxygen, push, push the code button, start chest compressions. We did it over and over on a mannequin. But when I became a nurse and I was on the floor and my first patient stopped breathing on me and coded, in that split second, it's not about thinking, well, what do I do? What do I do? You kick into the automatic everything that I've practiced, everything that I've learned, and you go into automatic mode. I believe God wants that for us. I want to be so full of the word of God, and I want to have memorized the word. I want to be prayed up, full of the Holy Spirit. So in that moment where you don't have time to think about how you're going to react to something or what you're going to do, I want the Holy Spirit to spill out. I want God's word to spill out of me. I want to act because I've made the habit every single day to make decisions to glorify him. You want to hear, do you want to hear the rest of the story? Yeah. You want to hear what happened? Okay. The girls continue to sell books and magazines. Five months later, the sales director asked them to attend a training seminar at a small church that was two hours away by bus. After they arrived at the church, they after they arrived, they approached the church, they noticed a tall youth standing, staring at them. Inez smiled at him and greeted him. Good afternoon, she says. My name is Inez. And my name is Damaris, her companion said. The young man smiled and says, I think we've met before. Yes, Inez responded, you, you do look familiar to me, but, but I just don't remember your name. The young man handed her a Bible and said, do you recognize this? I caught my breath, Inez said. 
It was my old Bible, the one that I had given to the gang leader. I stared at him in total amazement. Do you remember when you gave me this Bible? You told me it would change my life, and you were right. Jesus worked a miracle in my life. The girls listened as Jose told them how he had begun to read that Bible, searching for peace and the love that he had saw in their lives. After they visited for a few minutes, Jose said, would you like to see the others that were with me that night? They entered the church. They found eight young men sitting next to each other on the front row. As they talked, they learned that all nine boys had been baptized. They had heard about the seminar, and they prayed that they would get to meet the girls again. After the seminar, the boys had invited Inez and Damaris to their homes. Inez asked Jose, how was your life before you became converted to Jesus? With tears, Jose told the girls that he had felt unloved and worthless. Those feelings had pulled him into a life of crime. But he added with a smile, from the night that I met you girls, I realized there was hope for me. The families of the boys greeted the girls with smiles and hugs. They saw that the teenagers had returned home that night somehow changed. They no longer spent time terrorizing people. Instead, they spent hours studying the Bible and the magazines that the girls had given them. At the time of this writing, five years later, they are leaders in their church and their community. Their families, as they saw the changes in them, began to ask questions, and each one of those nine men have led their family to Christ, along with friends. By 1995, 52 people had been baptized because of this story. The mighty power of God can and will save the lost. It's not us. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit power in our lives. Having the heart of Christ to love those boys, to long for them, do we love others? Do we love others the way that God loves us? I think one thing that I think must make God unhappy is how much love that he is willing to show us. How much mercy and grace that he poured out for each and every one of us. And when he asks you to turn and give it to the person next to you, you're like, ooh, no. We have got to wake up and say, listen, I know this world is full of darkness, God, and I'm one of them but I want to be emptied of who I am and be filled with your light and your glory so that as I go out today, I will have the mind of Christ. I will have the heart of Christ. I will love others as you love them, God. And because of that, you will light up this world with your glory. All he's asking is, is are you willing? He doesn't want perfect people because he knows we're not even capable of that. He wants people who are willing to be his light in this darkness. Let's pray together. Precious, loving, heavenly Father, I think you are incredibly amazing that you would love a sinner like me, that you would love humanity, God, to the point of sending your son Jesus to die for us. You have shown us incredible mercy and incredible grace, but we have been selfish with that. But it's time, Lord, it's time for us to be filled with this love, this light, and this glory so that we can love others the way that Jesus did. We can pray for them. We can speak as the Holy Spirit leads us and that you will show forth your power like you never have before. May we make a difference, God, not because we are good, but because you are good. May we be willing, Lord, to be filled with your Holy Spirit and go out and love other people as you did. May we have a story and a testimony to tell of people that 
we have brought to you just by loving them and being bold to share your truth. I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. We have Sabbath school in the sanctuary. We have it in behind the glass here. We have it in the library, and I believe there's one in the pastor's office. I pray you'll be blessed. Question, can you tell us the name of that book? Oh, yes. It's called 30 Days to a More Powerful Prayer Life by Joe Anthony and Chris Hughes. A Plan to Keep Praying Powerful. So 30 Days to a More Powerful Prayer Life. All right. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. I was... Faith was reading that story to me this week, and uh, we said, oh, we've got to share that. Because I thought, in, during that story, I thought, what would I do? Now, our first response is we'd probably pray. But we'd be looking for some divine deliverance, save me from this situation, not give me strength to witness to them. So, all right, as we get started, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, it's good to be in your house this morning. Um, it's a little nippy outside, but we're thankful to be alive. We're thankful to be here, and we are thankful that Jesus is coming soon. As we open our Bibles this morning and we study, we ask that you will join us. Open our hearts and our minds that we will understand the truth, that we will understand what you want for us in these last days so that we can spend eternity together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I am just going to jump right in. Um, the lesson this morning, actually, there's a lot to cover. And I thought about skipping my, I don't know what you want to call it, kind of uh, state of the union, if you will, how we're doing in the world. and. I've had several people ask that I not do that, that they really appreciate that. So we're going to cover just a few things real quick um, in the news most recently. Um, I think it helps remind us where we are because we can become very complacent. First item I have is the cost of fertilizers have roughly tripled since last year, which has serious implications for the world food production. So they're saying there are... Um, the world is facing the prospect of a dramatic shortfall in food production as rising energy prices cascade through global agriculture. And they went on to say that we are nine meals away from anarchy. Interesting thought. So the next one is anarchy in Haiti. Um, as you're aware, in July, the president, I don't even know how to say his name, Mosey, uh, was assassinated. Um, two days before his assassination, he had identified who his replacement would be. Speculation is he had him assassinated. Um, but then this gang, the G9 Alliance of Gangs, has for nearly a month been preventing trucks from reaching the Virux fuel terminal outside Port-au-Prince, leading to shortages that have forced hospitals, businesses, schools to limit operations. 
we know that they have a history of um, uprisings. And I think the last one, uh, there were a lot of people that died. U.S. food banks struggle to feed the hungry amid a, quote, perfect storm of food inflation. Supply chain disruptions, lower inventory, higher transportation and fuel costs, and labor shortages are affecting millions who rely on food banks. Never really stopped to think about how many people rely on food banks for food. We think, oh, you know, you go to Kroger's, you get food. Not the case. He also said, importing canned food from overseas has become incredibly expensive because shipping container rates have gone from $4,000 to $18,000 in less than a year. The cost for a truckload of peanut butter, 40,000 pounds, has soared 80%. And it goes on. We feel it, we see it. It's going to get worse. Um, United States issued the first passport with an X gender marker. I don't even have to comment. For, uh, this, is, this one concerned me. Former Trump National Security Advisor Michael Flynn, you guys may have heard this, calls for one religion in America. He says, if we're going to have one nation under God, which we must, we have to have one religion. One nation under God and one religion under God, said Flynn, who recently talked about his Christian faith in the public. One religion. All right, next item. Afghans selling their daughters. So we pulled out of Afghanistan. The United Nations warns that 97% of the Afghan population will be below the poverty line by the end of the year as the Taliban takes over the country. So in poverty, um, let's see, families lack money even to buy food. Many Afghan families feel forced to sell their daughters in order to raise money for food. Children are being sold for just a couple thousand dollars as servants and wives. World is falling apart, isn't it? U.S. Marines are training with Israeli Defense Forces in preparation for confrontation with Iran. They believe it's inevitable. China plans to have 1,000 nuclear weapons within 10 years in a bid to overtake U.S. nuclear arsenal. Another coup in Sudan. Okay, so there's another coup. Um, Sudan, just as a reminder, Sudan's last civil war lasted 22 years and over 2 million people died. California reports the driest water year recorded in a century. In a year of both extreme heat and extreme drought, California has reported its driest water year in terms of precipitation in a century and expect next year to be worse. So the worst in a century, and next year is going to be worse. And then, of course, there was a bunch of natural disasters, which I could go on and on. Now, that would take too much time. I see a bunch of earthquakes and flooding. and People don't lose sight of where we're at in time. We can get up. We can go to work. We can go about our daily duties. We can be insulated from a lot of what is going on. But these are happening for a purpose because God is trying to wake us up. So, all right, let's move on into the Sabbath school lesson. Choose life. How many options are there? You get a choice. How many options are there? Two. Two. Eternal life or eternal death? Now, some may propose, well, there's eternal torment. Some may say, if, uh, you know, if you're Mormon, that there's different levels of eternal life. They have three heavens. Um, you can be in a lower class. 
But there's really, according to the Bible, two choices. Eternal life and eternal death. So which one do you choose? Okay, pretty simple question, right? All right, I guess we're done with the lesson. Why is it so difficult? Why is this decision so difficult? The natural inclination is to strive to live. Isaac? Because you have to give up what you like or what you you inclined to do and you do what you like, like uh, Paul said, whatever I will, I want to go, that's what my okay. heart like to do. So. You have to give up what you like. But we know, if I can extend that, what we like leads to death. The devil has become <clears throat> so adept at causing people misery that, that there are people who come to the point of saying, I prefer death because life is so miserable. It, it just turned God Does. upside down so that truly within our world there are people choosing death. Yes. Deliberately. In fact, I have worked with an individual, just coincidental, his name was Ron. It's not me. Um, and uh, he was single. Every day after work, he would go to the bars. He lived to drink. I mean, that was his life. And I talked to him, and I said, don't you want something better? He goes, no, I don't. You're, you're going to pass on eternal life. He goes, yeah. He goes, I don't care. This is what I want. I think following up on what Dr. Small said about people choosing death uh, was just supported this week. I heard a statistic on the number of deaths by suicide during the pandemic and the records that were broken and so on and so forth as an indication that when people lose hope, they don't have the hope of eternal life. They don't have hope of a supportive family. They don't have the love of a good husband or wife or whatever the case may be. That that hope that, that they are lacking causes them then, then to despair and obviously choose death over life because it's too painful to continue living. Yes, that, has, that is a true fact. Suicidal rates have increased dramatically um, from the pandemic. Suicidal rates have increased dramatically among young people with this um, identity confusion. Um, in all this, the devil wins. So I'm going to back the story up just to the beginning. Well, I guess I'll call it the beginning. We have a book, The Great Controversy. The full title is The Great Controversy Between Christ and Satan. Lyndall, you had your hand up. I think even among Christians, I, I think an awful lot of the issue is how deceptive the devil has been. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think I have a good handle on keeping the lens of my mind focused in this duality. I'm choosing eternal life. I'm choosing eternal death. It's too easy for the Christian to want what's here that looks attractive and want eternal life. I think the key is perspective that remains constant. And I think we can only do that if we feed our minds daily, hourly. I mean, e even if we fail on the hourly, I mean, one, one minute we, we have good perspective, and the next minute we're being deceived. So I think, you know, it's, it's constancy of relationship with Christ. Without that, we don't have a prayer of a chance to keep proper perspective, and we go through our lives with a duality that, that is not real. Okay. Constancy in our relationship with Christ. Very important. I think it even goes deeper than that. We're going to get into that. 
Con the great controversy between Christ and Satan. What was the issue between Christ and Satan? Rob? So, God's character is really an issue. And when it, as it relates to creation, created beings, the question is, does God have our best interest in mind? Or is God selfish and self-serving and does not have our best interest in mind? And so when Satan through the serpent in the Garden of Eden approached Eve, uh, he insinuated that God does not have their best interest in mind. He said, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. God's holding out on you. He does not have your best interest in mind. And if you knew what I know and what he knows, you would be you know, better off. You're being deceived by God. Well, we have all bought into that lie to a certain extent. And that, I think, so it, it all relates back to God's character. Why would we not choose life? Why would we not choose God's ways? Even as Christians, as Linda was saying, it's because there is a certain, to a certain degree, we all have still bought into Satan's lie that God does not have our best interest in mind, that we know better. And uh, that's the day-to-day -day struggle, I think, for many of us. Absolutely correct. Lindell said, talking about deceptions. There's constant deceptions in front of us. He puts in front of us. Deceptions that this is good, that this is better. That, uh, peel that onion back just a little bit. Um, very accurate. But I'll just read a couple quick statements. Coveting the glory which the infinite Father had invested in his Son... The prince of angels aspired to power that was the prerogative of Christ alone. Jealousy. The son, so Jesus approaches him. The son of God presented before him the greatness and goodness and the justice of the creator and the sacred unchanging nature of his law. God himself had established the order of heaven and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his maker and bring ruin upon himself. But the warning given in infinite love and mercy only aroused a spirit of resistance. Lucifer allowed his jealousy of Christ to prevail and become the more determined. Jealousy of Christ. Goes on to dispute the supremacy of the Son of God. That was Lucifer's aim. Um, truth, justice, loyalty are struggling against evil and jealousy. His desire for supremacy returned and envy of Christ was once more indulged. Then the other angels stood ready to second Lucifer's demand for equal authority with the Son of God. This all started with jealousy. Two sides. Satan's, Lucifer's, and Jesus. There's still just two sides. Satan's, we know, the story's already been written, leads to eternal death. Jesus leads to eternal life. Two sides. Ellen White says, we, we always quote one-third of the angels were lost. Ellen White says, almost half followed Lucifer. Deceptions. That's how he works. All right. So then after this rebellion, they, the Godhead, decide to create man. Okay? So man is created as Rob identified, Lucifer. So now today, how do we choose which side? This controversy has gone on for over 6,000 years. You fill out a form, check the box, I choose life. It's a lot like losing weight. A lot of, <laughs> a lot of people beginning of the year, right? going to lose my 10, 15 pounds. I've been carrying around for, you know, X number of years. But then comes the discipline, the requirement to get out of bed at a certain hour in order to get the exercise, the discipline of eating those things that actually would be beneficial to weight loss versus weight gain. And it's the same thing, I think, with spirituality. We make a decision. We want to serve Christ. We love him. We, we know the path is right. But then comes the discipline. Then comes the decision each and every morning, like Faith was saying, that I go to my knees, I surrender my will for his, I ask him to be my savior, 
and my guide for that day. And so often the devil just interjects and intercedes instead and defeats us even before we get out of bed in the morning. So for me, it's yes, I've chosen, but then the follow-up discipline is where uh, my steps are hampered. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going we're gonna to get deeper into that. How do we do that? What does that mean? Because it's easy to say as Christians we say this, but then how do you do it? How do you, if choosing life were that simple, why is it so hard for all of us? Pat. I think if we take our eyes off Jesus. I think, you know, you start the day, you've given your life to, to God, and you've made a commitment there, and then life happens. And somewhere in there, you forget to take in account that Jesus can help you and you take everything to him because you get distracted by all these problems and you just lose that focus on Jesus. And I, I've been praying, Lord, when my thoughts and situations get away from you, please bring me back to you because I just get distracted with other things that we have every problem, every situation needs to go to Jesus in a constant. And I think that walking with Jesus means we do that more and more as we go along. Every problem, every situation needs to go to Jesus. What about the other things in between? Did you ask Jesus what you should eat for breakfast this morning? Should you? I don't see any commitment on that one. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry, I missed a hand. Was there a hand? Wait, I'm sorry. just read that myself. In fact, I had a quote in here. <laughs> That's exactly the point. Yes, Adelaide. I'm glad she shared this because this is what I had in my heart as well. And, and somewhere else she says, Lord, I'm willing, make me willing. And also, she also says in the same book, why, why does God require you from us? Is that something that is going to hurt us? On the opposite. And she says, I'm ashamed to write it, you know, because everything that God requires is for our good. Right. It's nothing for our, it's for our good. It's all for our good. Dr. Small. I think one of the tasks that God has given us is to demonstrate how knowing Jesus and following him makes us happier. In our world today, there's a lot in society that is going against God's will. And for people to say, okay, if I like my lifestyle, which is contrary to the Bible, why should I go through a lot of effort 
attitude to try to reform my life so that I can live for, for eternity in a place where those are the rules that are in existence. There are a lot of people who don't, they don't like what heaven is going to be. Now, yeah. n neither do they want to burn in hell, but um, the, the, the loving of, we need to make Christianity so attractive that people will want to know where we get our happiness. You know, a loving God, you know, even if you choose eternal death, you will be put back into the condition that before you were created, nothingness. You know, it's not an eternal burning hell. We know this. Um, but have you ever thought, I was thinking this week, that we know that when Jesus returns, every person will acknowledge Jesus is Lord and every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father, even Satan. So you will choose or acknowledge Jesus aside either now or later. If you do it now, the outcome is much better. If you do it later, your fate is sealed. You're going to acknowledge it at one point. All right. Now, came up in my study today. I'm just going to read it real quick. The conditions of heaven are what they've always been, perfect obedience to the law. And we say, okay, we've got to strive harder. Another quote, man cannot be saved without obedience. We know that. But I'm just going to tell you up front, it's not my obedience. Okay? And that's what we're going to get into. So I was, uh, I think if everyone were honest, that we all struggle, as uh, Joe was saying, it's kind of like weight loss. We all struggle. And if this were a walk in the park, you know, our Christian walk would be so much easier. But it can be that. And that's what I'm going to get to. So I was talking with someone this week, and he expressed, we were talking about a subject and he expressed that we're all broken, and I'm going to quote some things here, that God is in the process of restoring us back to his image, that it's a work of a lifetime, he was referring to sanctification, that we are all imperfect, but God is changing us, and this restoration process will be finished when Jesus comes and we're changed in the twinkling of an eye, and at that point, Jesus makes up the difference in our imperfections. And he described it as, we're here. Perfection is here. In our life, we're progressing. If we die here, when Jesus resurrects us, he makes up the difference, and we go to heaven. What do you think of that? Lendl. I just think of a warfare perspective. You know, when a country is at war, uh, there's, there's typically not very much equivocating on the part of the soldiers that are, you know, the, the enemy is well defined, uh, the, the allegiances are, are there, uh, when you go, in, you go into battle there's deprivations, uh, it's not a walk in the park, but yet, you know, the, the mind frame of the soldier seems to be pretty well defined. Uh, I know what I'm warring against, I know what the goals are, and I'm not sure what I'm going to have to put out, but I know it's not going to be easy. The problem is, is with, the, with the Christian life, I don't always have that perspective. But if I did, and the enemy were always well defined in my mind, and the trust in, in a general that was known to win, I think my life would be much easier. We need to define, if we keep our eye on the enemy, we need to define who the enemy is. I'm going to say enemy is right here, self. Yeah, 
information level that is different from one that is five years. You can be perfect in the effort of one two years, at five years, at 15 years, but because you keep evolving as, as God has planned you to go. But if you say, I just have to get this point of perfection and then everything is good, I think even in heaven, when you get there, I don't think when Jesus, let's say Jesus comes to death. My, my body, my mind will change. Does it mean that 1,000 years I will be still the same? No. 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 I think when we get to heaven, we still have something to learn, something to add, something. So we still be growing up. Amen. So I think okay. this kind yeah. of perfection we should always be looking for. Be willing that God add every day something new in our life. So, it's hard to see over there. The light from that room, it's hard to see. Paul. But there is a life that will be. So what I want to point out here is I believe that concept that God is changing us is wrong. That may bother some of you. God is not an evolutionary God. God is a creationist. When his word is spoken, it has power and it changes. He doesn't evolve us. So there's four points that I want to hit, and I'm quickly running out of time. Jesus is our example. Amen? Amen. All right. So at least we got that. So when Philip asked Jesus to show him and his brethren the Father, Christ replied, and he said, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I have spoken unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. All right? Now, this is not talking about the Godhead and the relationship of um, the Son to the Father. And what is Jesus saying? You have been so long with me, you have, you ask me to see the Father What's he saying? I believe Jesus is saying very clearly that he, Jesus, as a person, is submitted completely to the Father. The Father is living the Father's life in Jesus perfectly. So in other words, when you look at Jesus, you're actually seeing the life of the Father lived out in him. So, the question is, when you see me, have you, you know, you asked to see the Father? I, this is the Father that you see living through me. Okay, God is not an evolutionary God. Some may argue that when we're converted, um, they can do good, or if their heart is motivated by love, they can do better. And others think that if God gives them the strength to do it, 
then their um, strength to do it then um, in their own works will be acceptable. But all this is incorrect. For the one thing that the law requires is the perfect obedience of God himself in our lives. So the perfect surrender, my life will never be able to comply with the law. I can't choose life in and of myself. The way I choose life is letting God live in me. My life is done, it's gone. Jesus died, we died with him. The struggle is keeping it buried, keeping him buried, him or her. Just a side note, I'm going to run out of time, but I'm going to hit this. The Sabbath is a sign that we have let go of our old lives and are now permitting God to live his own life through us. It is a sign that we have been sanctified or set apart for a holy use. If it is God performing all the works in our lives, all our works will be holy without sin. Amen? So there's not this struggle of trying to do better every day. It's this struggle of keeping yourself dead, buried. All right. Um, all those who receive the seal of the living God in their foreheads testify to the fact that they are no longer living their own lives. It is God living his life in them. That is the sealing process. I heard two different things there. Um, our growth is stunted and our lack of willingness to surrender. I think those are two different things because our growth, we are not growing. We are dead. That's what we have to remember. We need to stay dead. It's our lack of surrender. Every moment I got up this morning and myself woke up. I won't give you the example. <laughs> All right. Um, so we, we find it hard to be a Christian, and it's, it's probably because we find it hard to stay dead. It's easy living if we're dead. Think about it. When Jesus was in the boat, why? And the storm came, he was sleeping. The story always amazes me. I've thought about it over and over. How could Jesus sleep through the storm? Think about it. It's not his problem. If God wants him to drown in a storm, okay. It's God's life in him. It's not his life that he's living. It's God living his life in him. If God will wake him up and wants him to come, he'll wake him up when it's time. We take those things on and we try to solve all those problems. The disciples were rowing, bailing, trying to solve the problem. Lyndall. Now I, I look back at Abraham's life. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. I mean, a righteous life is what we should be aiming at. And I think sometimes we perfection as the point in one's life when we when it's time that we don't need to learn anything else. And I guess I would contest that and say if Christ has covered me with his righteousness and I'm surrendered to him, 
I still have a lot to learn. Because even when we get to heaven, I think we're going to we're going to go through eons and learn more about Christ's character. And I believe it's knowing Christ's character and having that relationship with him that allows us to grow. So even though, you know, I don't know how you want to define perfection, but whatever it is, it does not preclude continued growth. That's correct. Jesus, we're told, grew in stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew in his relationship, but yet he was perfect. I don't want to get hung up on the perfect, because how I define perfect is the perfect surrender to God that we had back here. It is letting God live in us. That's where the perfect works will come from, not from us. All of our works are as filthy rags. There is nothing that we can do that is appealing to God. He doesn't want us. He wants to be in us and doing that. So I'm, I'm just going to bring up a new point. Matthew 1.23 says, Behold, a virgin shall be born with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which interpreted is God with us. What does that mean? Now again, it's not talking about the Godhead. It's not talking about um, who Jesus was as um, you know, part of the Godhead or the Son of God. Um, it's really saying something completely different if we understand what we're being told. Yes? No, no question. All right. So I'm going to read from A.T. Jones. We know Jones and Wagner, um, very instrumental in the message of 1888. He made a statement. He could not be God with us without becoming ourselves, because it is not himself that is manifest in the world. We do not see Jesus in this world as he was in heaven. He did not come into this world as he was in heaven, nor was that personality manifested in the world which was in heaven before he came. He emptied himself and became us. Then, putting his trust in God, God dwelt with him, and he being ourselves and God being with him, he is God with us. We can be God with us. Did you get that? It wasn't Jesus as God, a divinity, a divine person. It was God living in him that was being prophesied God with us. A perfect, surrendered life. Do you, do you understand that? All right. Um, two other thoughts, and I had one bell. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What does that mean? So why do we have problems in the church and the family? Because we are not dead. Self is still alive. And so don't point the finger at anyone else. Examine yourself. Are you alive or are you dead? And is Christ living in you? If Christ is living your life, you will not be stressing about what you see. You will be like Jesus in the boat in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, sleeping with perfect peace. What do you have to worry about? I'm being a little flippant, but it's not your problem. God's life in you. Because if God's problem, oh, because it's God's problem, not yours. And Jesus trusted that God would resolve the problem. Do we get to that point? That's how we end up, that's how we have peace. That's a Christian's life that is peaceful because we are completely relying on God. So I mentioned a quote, and I need to skip ahead and get to this, that sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Do we understand what that means? What it, sanctification is the work of a lifetime. God works with us over our entire life to get us to a point of no. That's not what she's saying. Um, many people have this concept that sanctification is where God takes the old man and he puts him through a process and purifies him. Many people think that sanctification is learning obedience. No. Sanctification is the result of a lifetime of obedience, not learning to be obedient. 
Do you see the difference? It's the result of a lifetime of surrender to God. Not learning to be obedient, not learning to do the right thing. We have misquoted this many, many, many times in church. So, um, we must have obedience in our lives every moment. How? By letting Christ take our sinful selves to an eternal grave. That's the only way we're going to get there. Um, so I want to end with this thought. God is waiting for us to stop trying to work things out ourselves. How's he going to perfectly reproduce his character and his people? Stop trying to work things out ourselves. Stop trying to save ourselves. Stop trying to make our own plans or speak our own words or do our own works. He's waiting for us to stop doing all of that. He's waiting for us to choose life. Because there is only one life. If Christ is not living our life, we are living a lie. You get that? If Christ is not living our life, we are living a lie, and really, we're dead men walking. Paul? Or, I'm sorry, the hand was behind Paul. like the story that Faith shared with us this morning. The girls had already chosen life to completely surrender. They were told to go give a Bible study. They went and gave the Bible study. They had to go down this road. God was living their life. Why do they have to worry? And then in doing that, He is going to draw others to Him. So the last thought here is, Jesus is, He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. How many ways are there? One. One. How many truths are there? One set of truths. How many lives are there? One. Not yours and Jesus. There's one life. It's all singular. It is Jesus' life in you. That's the only life that can choose life. Do you understand that? There is no other choice. So to choose life this morning, give up all your own ambitions, your desires, your thoughts. Wake up every morning, say, God, I surrender my life to you. What do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? And then the whole other part of the study would be, how do you hear God speak to you then so you understand? Let's uh, close with prayer. Father in heaven, um, the message is so simple, but yet we make it so complicated. We try to help you. You don't need our help. You need us to constantly let you reign in our lives. Every time we raise ourselves and try to help you, we mess it up. There's nothing that we can do that's any good. We need to keep ourselves out of the way, buried eternally in death, in the death that Jesus had, that we can share in the life, the eternal life that Jesus has. We love you. We thank you for this simple message. And we ask that you will help each of us live that perfect, surrendered life. In Jesus' name.